All right, here's my Bogart titles. This is the MGM UA release of They Drive By Night. Uh, it's a, I believe it's a mid '90s release, so it's a, one of their later nice reissues of classic uh, '40s Hollywood. Has the original mono mix as uh, PCM on digital tracks, so it's a nice benefit. Uh, it's a nice transfer of this very great classic uh, Warner Brothers film. This was when the uh, Warner Library titles under the Turner deal were being distributed by MGM UA. So it's always a bit odd seeing the classic Warner Gangster pictures or Casablanca or uh, Wizard of Oz or other titles coming out on MGM. Of course, now that no longer happens, now they're all back under the Warner banner. But anyway, uh, this is a great classic film uh, directed by Raoul Walsh. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a patchwork of some earlier Warner's pictures, so if you're very familiar with a lot of uh, classic Warner Brothers films, you might recognize some elements, but it's really its own beast. Um, you know, it's its own thing um, despite that. And of course, this is one of George Raff's great uh, featuring lead parts. So um, if you're a George Raff fan or you're, one, you're wondering... Uh, what George Raft was like, this is a great place to start. Uh, of course, this was when Bogart was still more of the supporting player. This was uh, before the uh, double whammy of High Sierra and the Maltese Falcon that really uh, broke him to prominence. Um, so this is really the very tail end of his uh, days as being the, either the second in command or the gangster that always gets killed in the last reel by uh, Raft or Cagney or Robinson or Muni or anybody else that had top billing. Uh, but this is a wonderful picture full of truly great uh, performances from either the great character actors at Warner's or uh, the fantastic Ida Lupino or, of course, Bogart in the supporting part or George Raft in the lead. Um, and it's a really interesting picture. It's a slice of life, you know, because it's about truckers in the 1940s, um, at least for the first half or so. But uh, it's a really great picture that's not talked about enough. Plus, this is probably the start of my uh, major crush on Ann Sheridan. So go figure. Next we have the MGM UA release of the Maltese Falcon, of course. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of all time and uh, an absolutely perfect picture. And if you've never seen this, drop what you're doing, see it immediately, don't spoil it. Uh, based on Dashiell Hammett's classic uh, novel, which almost single-handedly changed the landscape of uh, detective and mystery fiction. Uh, the film makes one or two very, very, very minor adjustments, but otherwise it's the first uh, adaptation that was faithful, there have been two previous versions that had, uh, the, the first was a pre-code 1931 film, which has its own merits, but it's not really the novel. And then there was a 1936 more comedic adaptation called Satan Metal Lady, which is definitely not the novel. Uh, but this film is really what solidified Bogart as a star, and it's a masterpiece. Uh, and it was also, believe it or not, John Huston's first uh, directing gig, which is astonishing because it's absolutely flawless. Here's the rear cover. Uh, pretty simple. This is analog only sound. Uh, it's an older disc, I believe from the late 80s, so it's not quite as old as the uh, first couple releases. And uh, right around the time this came out, they had the, uh, it was during the time of the uh, colorization uh, dark days when they were colorizing various films that uh, classic films that Ted Turner owned or other people owned and they were playing around with that and then that led to the congressional hearings and then thank heavens they had decided to abandon that for the most part aside from a few things here and there since that have happened and been presented in a colorized form but this film was actually colorized and it is uh, available if you track down the uh, colorized VHS uh, release. It's one of the uh, travesties of, well, one of the great travesties of home video is that this film was colorized because the black and white photography is extraordinarily important, of course, and that's, you know, just desecrating a masterpiece. Um, but anyway, it's also one of the uh, founding titles that can be, you know, labeled as the start of film noir. If you wanted to label the start point, you could say Stranger on the Third Floor, or you could say um, this film in 1941, Elements of Susan Kane also in 1941. Uh, but you know, this is another, it's another reason why it's important. It's also the screen debut of Sidney Greenstreet. You wouldn't believe it's his first performance, um, but it's absolute magic. And if you haven't seen it, see it immediately. I cannot recommend this highly enough. It's an American masterpiece and one of the greatest films ever made. Um, 
and I could talk about it for hours. But anyway, uh, this is the best American release on Laserdisc, sadly. Uh, there was going to be a box set of Bogart titles, I think his big three, Maltese Falcon, uh, Treasures of Sierra Madre, and I think Casablanca as well. But that came when Laserdisc was being killed off, so MGM canceled that. Uh, there's also a Japanese box set from the mid-90s that... Uh, has Maltese Falcon with a digital PCM mono track. Uh, if you're really dedicated, you can track that one down if you want the technically best version on Laserdisc. But uh, you know this this can be had for pretty cheap if you're determined to have it on Laser. And you know it's nice to see a older print transfer done to analog back in the day. And this is a lot better than the earlier ones. Next we have the MGM release of Tab and Have Not, the magical, whimsical Howard Hawks film based on the Hemingway novel. Uh, famously, Howard Hawks told Hemingway, I bet I can make a great picture out of your worst novel. Hemingway responded, what's that? And Hawks responded, that piece of crap you called to Have and Have Not. So when you see this, I mean, it's pretty much... Uh, Howard Hawks' riff on Casablanca right down to the plot structure. It's just the locales and the uh, some of the actors and actresses have changed around. And of course, this is the picture that gave us the immortal Lauren Bacall, and you truly, truly see a connection between the two actors on screen. It's it's absolutely undeniable. Uh, so it's it's magic for you know the the atmosphere and the ambiance, but. You know, if you were looking very critically, you know, you're you're going to spot a lot of Casablanca similarities. So, but it but it is a great classic. It does have the original mono as PCM on the digital tracks. This is a '90s release, so pretty much flawless in that regard. It's a nice transfer of a good element. Um, you know, it's it's pretty on par with what eventually came on DVD. But now Warner Archive has released this on Blu-ray uh, from a 2K scan of their elements, and it looks beautiful. So. Um, that's a great high bit rate release. Definitely recommend that. But if you want this film on Laserdisc, this is what you're going to be going for. Uh, nice back with uh, stills. No special features, sadly. But, um, you know, it's it's nice to have. And I've been picking away at the some of my favorite Bogart films. Here is the MGM again release of Ox is the Big Sleep. This, of course, is the 1946 masterpiece that... Um, <laughs> Even though it's it is an adaptation of Chandler's debut novel, it's also not an adaptation. It kind of has a way of its own. Sort of has a sort of fast and loose, uh, whimsical tone, and it plays around with Chandler's novels. So it's a very faithful adaptation that, at some instances, really isn't. But it's it's its own entity, and it's absolute magic. It's wonderful. Um, and of course, the whole point is to get Bogey and McCall um, in one another's arms. So there's the front, here's the rear cover, has the original mono as uh, digital, on, as PCM on the digital tracks. Same thing here, nice use of production stills, typical MGM layout, and here you have the original Lobby One sheet. Um, of course, this is the 1946 theatrical release version. Uh, later on, on the DVD, they finally released the rare, very much unseen 1945 preview version that has some different scenes and stuff that were later reshot and taken out and modified for some of the more memorable moments in this uh, theatrical version. So it was primarily done to beef up Bacall's part. Her agent was worried about uh, the film she had done between Have and Have Not and The Big Sleep, um, it, which that film confidential agent was not successful at all. And the good reviews she had gotten for Have and Have Not were not good on confidential agent. So confidential agent. So he wanted to make sure this film was successful for his client. So that's what led to some of these uh, reshoots and uh, also general tightening of the film, some swapping of some scenes around, and then some of the most famous moments in the film, especially the uh, uh, table discussion about the racetrack and uh, jockeys on horseback, uh, which has some of the great double entendres of cinema. Um, got inserted for this theatrical version so um, this is the theatrical version for the preview version you'll want the dvd or the absolutely wonderful new warner archive blu-ray um, which is actually recommended here is the mgm release of key largo um, much more standardized here it's kind of the usual old mgm style of sort of the airbrushed uh, artist rendering of either the original poster or images from the film into sort of a poster montage. 
Uh, this one actually looks quite nice. Um, I have to say, you would almost think this was a, I don't think this was an original poster, but um, it could have been, or it could have been a lobby card or something. Uh, nice layout with the jacket, and you can tell with this green here, it seems like this was originally intended for a VHS release, because um, it's kind of got that aspect going on here. But um, still, it looks very, very nice. It's just the green on the sides is a little odd. Um, it does have the original mono as PCM on the digital tracks. Uh, it's a lot better than the older analog-only uh, issues from the early 90s, so it's a nice pressing. Uh, it's of a print element in pretty good shape. Uh, the DVD, of course, is better, and the new Warner Archive Blu-ray is fantastic, but if you want it on Laserdisc, this is a very nice disc to have, and it's the one to go for. Um, because a lot of these, the earlier ones, are analog only, they're a bit hazy, and, you know, of course, older transfer is not going to be as good as a newer transfer. So we have a Universal Encore Edition double feature of two classic Dietrich, Marlene uh, Dietrich pictures, uh, Seven Centers and Pittsburgh, uh, with the original mono as uh, PCM on the digital tracks. That's a nice bonus. Uh, this is very similar. Actually, it's the same design as their uh, double feature encore release of two of the classic uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Anthony Mann films, which we'll get to in the in a minute. Here's the gatefold. Gives you some nice information about each film. A nice layout with the uh, chapter stops on the bottom. Looks like, and uh, they each have the original theatrical trailer, which is always a nice bonus. This, this one here. I really like these releases. I'm kind of, I kind of wish they had done more because they're nice, economical, and some of these films were not uh, commonly available. These were done later than the first encore disc. The first encore discs were usually of more popular titles. It's kind of funny. A lot of the lesser known or lesser released pictures, when they got released later, they got better transfers from better elements with digital sound, and. Uh, the more popular films that came out first <laughs> kind of suffered as a result. So that's why you started seeing a lot of the films that had already come out starting to get more and more reissues because the original discs were actually quite old when LaserDisc was ending. So rear cover here, images from the film, uh, descriptions, and you get the uh, cast and crew credits on the bottom. So it's a nice little package of two films that really don't get much discussion, kind of get swept by the way, swept to the wayside. Now moving on to my Errol Flynn titles on laser. This is the MGM release of Captain Blood. Again, a Warner Brothers film released under MGM, so that's still really strange to see. Um, same thing here, kind of an airbrushed look to uh, a still from the film. Um, this, of course, is the 1935 swashbuckling masterpiece that brought Errol Flynn to the world in his full glory. Um, this was the first film he had the he, leading role for, and it's really the film that made him famous. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best pirate film ever made. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's a joy. It hasn't dated one bit. And if you've never seen this before, when you see it, you'll see uh, reflected in it all of the films that have been inspired by it or have directly lifted from it. Everything from Pirates of the Caribbean to, uh, you know, any swashbuckling fantasy adventure film, uh, whether it's sci-fi fantasy or a pirate film or anything. This is one of the great screen adventure films. And like I said, it hasn't dated a minute. And I saw this and I fell in love with Errol Flynn forever. Um, Olivia de Havilland too, of course. Um, directed by Mike Curtiz, absolute breathless pace and not, not a bad scene, not a bad moment. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and of course, extremely famous for the uh, sword fight that Flynn has with Basil Rathbone as the uh, rival French pirate captain um, over over like the uh, rocks on the beach. So it's an interesting sword fight because it doesn't take place within a building or on a ship. It takes place on sort of like this rocky, rocky area in front of uh, the actual surf coming in. So. Um, Typical back here for MGM, uh, sort of the uh, plain background. It's, I guess it's kind of treated to look almost like parchment, like a treasure map, which is an interesting idea. Um, I do like the the way they package this. They kind of tried to keep the um, yeah swashbuckling adventure, the the whole tone of it, 
uh, kept in the packaging. So this is a very nice Laserdisc release. Um, I think it's pretty much the same element that's on the DVD. Of course, being a 1935 film, the elements aren't going to be as available as, say, a newer film. And this film was printed a lot and reissued. It was very popular. So, um, you know, this does have some damage and stuff, but it's a very nice transfer and it has the original mono as PCM on the digital track. So, you know, it's, it's roughly equivalent to the DVD, and that's the same version you see on TCM. And I, I'm absolutely hoping Warner Archive uh, does this and some of the other Flynn titles on uh, as part of their Blu-ray line because this would look stunning and it really deserves a Blu-ray. But next we have Flynn de Havilland and Curtis return for 1936 Charge of the Light Brigade, another adventure classic uh, from Warner Brothers, released by MGM UA has the original monos PCM on the digital tracks. Unfortunately, my copy has a little bit of damage on the cover, but it's still a very nice cover. You get the whole sense of, you know, uh, doomed fatalism, uh, military pomp and circumstance, it, romance, old-fashioned romance, really, and old-fashioned heroism, because that's what this film is all about. Um, of course, great classic film, and this is a very nice laser disc, again with a gatefold. Here they go with uh, usage of stills from the film, production stills, lobby card images. And here you have the one, original one sheet with your chapter stops spread across three sides. Pretty uh, practically the same idea as the Captain Blood, pa Captain Blood packaging, uh, but I, I, I love how they kind of had a similar um, design scheme. So it's like they were a series that go together it's like you could go from one to the next and uh, the packaging kind of reflects that and it does it very well and it also gives the identity of the film. Here you have some of the almost desert-like settings and then Flynn and his different regalia here. So um, it's a very nice release and of course very comparable, comparable to the DVD and again another that would be wonderful on Blu-ray. Here we have the MGM UA release of The Prince and the Pauper. Uh, this is an interesting adaptation of the uh, original Dickens story. Um, you know, it, it, it plays it pretty straight, but it's also condensed down to, you know, a shorter running time because it is from 1937. It has a lot in common with some of the uh, David O. Selznick adaptations, such as his version of Tale of Two Cities from 1935. Um, so if you've seen those or you've ever seen an uh, older Hollywood adaptation of classic literature that's trying to be, you know, prestigious and serious, um, you'll know they always make some concessions. But um, this is a really enjoyable picture. You know, it's a little slow here and there. But, of course, once Errol comes in, everything's forgiven. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's bits of it that's kind of like a precursor to Adventures of Robin Hood as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great fun watch. And this is a very nice laser disc. Um, same thing with the others, uh, mono as PCM on the digital tracks. It's a nice gatefold like the others, so I think they did that to match them. Uh, across three sides with the original theatrical trailer. Oh, this has the original MGM Lion Roars on laser insert. I kind of like that. And it has uh, all the titles from this year and that year. It's double-sided. You could actually use this as a uh, ordering sheet. So I always like it when I still find these in, in a laser disc I find. So I um, always leave them in there. And here they use the other side of the gatefold for the entire, um, I guess that's a slightly shrunk version of the one sheet or a lobby poster. Um, William Keeley directed this, who is a very great Warner Brothers contract director who, like several, well, like many others, were under contract at Warner Brothers, never really got uh, credit for how talented they were. Um, very nice rear cover, kind of treated to make it look almost like it's an old uh, printed advertisement. The paper, all the color background here is treated to almost look like old parchment, I think. And you get this lovely rendering, almost making it look like a page of Gutenberg Bible text or something. Um, so it's a very nice laser disc and it's a very good transfer. It's the same as the DVD, which is, uh, which went out of print and now you can get it from Warner Archive as a DVD R if you really want the DVD version, but the laser disc can be had for pretty cheap. 
And of course, we have the MGM UA release of Adventures of Robin Hood. Uh, this complements the Criterion. Uh, it's it's a bit of a different transfer, and it, you know if you're used to the HD restored version or the DVD version, which was restored from the original uh, three color Technicolor strip uh, negative. You know this is going to look different because they were still using you know original prints at that time, original print materials or reissue prints, etc., instead of the actual negatives. And there's uh, some discussion that the color on the new HD restored version is maybe not as good as it could be. Um, unfortunately, I've never seen an original die transfer print of this, and if I did, I'd probably pass out due to excitement and joy, because um, this is one of the great Technicolor feasts for the eyes. This is one of the films that really sold Technicolor to the public. Um, of course, this is before Gone with the Wind, before Wizard of Oz as well. Um, but this, of course, needs little to no introduction. One of the great adventure films inspired thousands of imitators and uh, is, is Errol's definitive role. It's the role he's most well known for and is by far and large the best Robin Hood film ever made. Um, you know, there's elements in the you know original stories that may not be here, but this is what everybody remembers. And it's an absolute wonderful um wonderful time every time anyway so getting onto the cover design uh it's a very nice layout again the sort of mgm airbrush looking artist rendering of images from the film uh, of course with this green stripe over here you can see this was probably intended for the vhs release but on this one you know it's very similar to other mgm discs where they did that and they had sort of a uh, color block on the side with artist name, uh, actors' names or something. So at least it looks nice to the eyes. Has the original mono as PCM on the digital tracks. Uh, the print source is very good. It looks great, uh, but again, you know, it's different from the Criterion release. But uh, both are essential because the uh, Blu-ray is great, but the mono is lossy. So if you want it lossless, you need the laser disc and. Uh, the Criterion has some exclusive features that aren't on the Blu-ray. This is bare bones. It doesn't have any of the Criterion features, and they didn't do a special edition or anything. I kind of wish they had, but they probably would have just been repeating what was on the Criterion for the most part, um, just with their own people. <laughs> uh, nice back cover, but pretty simple, and uh, you can get this release for very cheap as opposed to the Criterion, and it's a lot. It's miles better than the older uh, analog-only ones. It only had analog sound, and uh, older transfers really wreak havoc with uh, Technicolor films, especially some of the early ones. Next, we have definitely, probably, no, I'll say definitely the most underrated of the classic uh, Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland pictures. This is uh, They Died With Their Boots On from 1940. This is a wonderful picture. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little hard to watch these days because Flynn plays... Uh, General Custer, and it's sort of um, sort of white, whitewashed in a way to make him as more of a noble hero who is trying to uh, help relations with the Native Americans. And you know, I mean, Hollywood did this several times at this time period. They made great films that weren't necessarily historically accurate, shall we say? Um, but if you can look past that, um, this is a great film. It's um, beautifully photographed, beautifully staged, beautifully performed, and, uh, you know, it, it really has the old style sense of um, military honor, I guess you would say would be the, the best way of putting it, or moral codes of man, etc. Um, but it's a very nice cover, has the original mono as uh, PCM on the digital tracks, gatefold like the others. Here you have nice Full spanning energy. Sorry about that. That those always seem to crackle, especially when they're not opened all the time. Um, if you can see all this, here's the chapter listings. You get the original theatrical trailer at the end. Uh, this is also pretty comparable to the DVD. This is one that would also be fantastic on Blu-ray for listening Warner Archive. Um, nice rear cover. Everything looks nicely integrated, um, but otherwise pretty standard for MGM Classic releases. Um, but still, it's a very nice laser disc, and it's a great classic that um, it should be more discussed like the other Flynn pictures, but sadly isn't. So if you haven't seen it, definitely give it a shot. 
and uh, yeah, it's a nice laser disc, and uh, it's pretty comparable to the DVD. So, last for them we have Adventures of Don Juan, also from MGM UA. Uh, has the original mono as PCM on the digital tracks. Uh, pretty simple standard cover. I know they used this one for the uh, VHS release as well. They just smushed it down to uh, VHS size. Here you have the rear. Nice usage of a hole still on the side. Uh, movie only. Pretty uh, pretty standard compared to the other um, other films we just looked at. Uh, this is one of Flynn's later films when he was getting older. You know, it's not really quite a classic like the other ones, but you know, it still has stuff going for it. And if you like swashbucklers or adventure films, or you're an Arrow fan, Arrow fan, Arrow fan like me, <laughs> you'll have to give it a watch at some point. Um, this is also again pretty comparable to the DVD, so it's not a bad laser just to pick up if you uh, spot one for cheap. And we have this lovely MGM Buster Keaton double feature of the cameraman and Spite Marriage. Um, I love this MGM Silent Classics banner here. You have the uh, MGM Lion regular logo on the top, and then on the side you have the spilling silver celluloid for the sulfur screen. Um, and then it has uh, silent score, well, scores on the uh, digital tracks PCM. Um, can't remember the, if they're mono or stereo, but um, these films, of course, have also been released on DVD. Um, I think as part of the uh, Keaton TCM Archives DVD set, if I remember correctly. But um, I I don't have that set um, specifically, but I'm pretty sure they'll be the uh, probably the same transfer as this laser disc and probably the same score. So this is a nice release. It's not too common, and I love the design MGM went with. Or you have the chapter stops. Uh, it's two discs with uh, the film. Uh, the cameraman goes on to side two, and then uh, Spite Marriage picks up there. I kind of wish they just used two discs and separated the films, but MGM pretty commonly did this where one film would lead into the next on a side, so they could save the printing costs of a single side. So, but with this, it's it's really kind of fine because they're in a set by themselves anyway. But it's a nice little release and I wish MGM had done a whole lot of these and made a whole line of uh, silent classics. Uh, but it's really nice having double feature sets because it's uh, of course a space and money saver and some of these films are shorter anyway so it's always nice to have something else to watch instead of you know having a short film on laser disc is just long enough to go to a second disc but you know it's only a couple minutes and then it's like well i got all the rest of the disc and nothing else to watch now we move on to the series shelf here we have 48 hours this is the uh, thx letterbox reissue um it's kind of a harder release to get uh from the mid to late 90s paramount spring uh, for the extra to get the THX stamp. Uh, it's basically a remastered widescreen pressing with the original Dolby stereo track as uh, PCM on the uh, digital tracks. And this same thing was, uh, same master was reused for the first non-anamorphic DVD. Uh, it's a pretty good disc. It's much better than the older ones, but it's not quite uh, the level you'd expect from a THX disc. Um, of course, lovely having the original poster artwork here. Uh, this is a film that's had a pretty interesting history on home video. Practically, um, you know, they've mastered this one pretty well for Laserdisc, and then the first DVD was crummy, and then the second DVD was finally anamorphic, but it was pretty much not really touched at all otherwise. And then the Blu-ray is kind of a smeary mess, so none of them look very good. Uh, this would be wonderful to hit 4K, especially with some of the um, deleted scene material that you can get a little flash of in the trailer, but it's a classic. Uh, this is what made Eddie Murphy a star, kind of really solidified the uh, buddy cop genre, and it's a great American uh, 80s classic that I also think is Walter Hill's best picture and Eddie Murphy's best picture. I can't speak highly enough of this, and it really holds up after all these years because of the inherent grittiness of it. So, there's 48 hours. And then, of course, you have to have the sequel, there's another 48 hours. 
from Paramount again, letterbox release, uh, seemingly from about the same time as the THX sticks because this is also a uh, early to mid 90s pressing. Um, nice to have the letterbox release. Um, pretty good transfer, nice sound mix. Of course, this coming from uh, 1990, it has a much more advanced Dolby stereo track than the original. Um, you know, it, it, it holds up decently, but there are big chunks that were cut out by the studio and it was kind of messed up at the last stage, so it's kind of incoherent that way. Um, but you know, they certainly should have done a third one. I think there's enough mileage in the tank for that. Um, heck, they could still do a third one as opposed to yet another Beverly Hills Cop nobody wants. So it's a nice laser disc and uh, same as the first DVD. Uh, this film has not come out on Blu-ray yet, so there'd be the hope that we'd get a director's cut, but I don't see Paramount doing that anytime soon. Here's one, I don't have the first film yet, but here is the sequel, Adam's Family Values. Another uh, nice 90s Paramount letterbox release. Uh, this has the original uh, Dolby 2.0 track. Um, as PCM on the digital tracks, and it sounds wonderful with some great separation. You'd almost swear it was uh, 5.1 AC3 at times. Uh, nice transfer. Uh, you know, a whimsical picture that's, you know, practically as good as the first one. Um, but it looks very nice on Laserdisc, and you can get this for very cheap. And it's out on DVD, same master and transfer pretty much. Uh, this one hasn't made it to Blu-ray yet, so finding this for cheap in the bins, why not? We have Beverly Hills Cop. This is the remastered letterbox release from Paramount. Same thing with 48 Hours. Uh, the earlier copies were pan and scan. This one is THX mastered. The original Dolby Stereo as PCM on the digital tracks. Uh, same thing with 48 Hours. Looks and sounds nice. Uh, unfortunately, this copy is a little warped, so uh, my player really hates any type of warped disc. So I've either got to try and flatten it out or um, find a disc that isn't warped. But otherwise, you know, it's it's pretty solid and it holds up well compared against the uh, Special Collector's Edition DVD. Um, I do think this mix sounds better than the 5.1. Um, but yeah, here's the rear cover. No special features, that's all on the DVD, so. Uh, again, it's kind of uncommon to find these uh, letterbox reissues from the 90s, so if you find them in good shape, it's worth picking up. Next we have the masterpiece that is Chinatown. This is the Paramount letterbox release from, I believe, 1991. Uh, scope transfer. Uh, this was really the first truly decent release of this film because pan and scanning this picture is a crime. And if you haven't seen it in the full uh, letterbox scope, you haven't really seen it at all. Um, has the original mono as PCM on the digital track. This release is also very well known for having Jerry Goldsmith's score isolated on the analog right track. Uh, it also has various sound effects as well. So this has been the source of many of those bootleg complete score releases you've seen on CD, um, whether in the bins or on eBay or something. That said, uh, Goldsmith's score was available on LP. Uh, Varese did a CD in 1995, and I believe they did a reissue CD with some extra material, and I've got to pick that one up before it goes out of print. But here's the gatefold. As usual, you get sort of a Paramount collage, but it looks very nice. Well, here we have almost the entire thing taken up by the infamous, uh, <laughs> this is what happened in the Nosy Fellows scene. But very nice. Here's the rear. I've always loved how Paramount letterbox releases literally have the cover letterboxed. Um, so it's pretty standard for the way they would do things, but down here it does a little detailing about the um, isolated score and effects, I believe is, yeah, it's down here. It's like briefly mentioned. You'd think they would have made a bigger thing out of it. Oh yeah, right here, music only, analog to music and effects. Um, but anyway, so it's important to have for that. It's a great transfer. And of course, the DVD and Blu-rays only have um, lossy mono. Um, so that's always nice. This was later repressed in 1997. I've heard good and bad about that. And it was, I'm presuming, recycled for that first 1999 DVD. Um, so if I ever pick that up, I'll do a comparison. But that's kind of harder to find anyway. Next we have, I'll slip it out of jacket. So we have, of course, 
the two Jakes, the long delayed uh, sequel to Chinatown. Um, originally, you know, there was supposed to maybe be a third film. This was originally going to be done in the mid 80s, and there's a big uh, troubled production history behind it. But finally, uh, Jack Nicholson took over and directed and starred in it, and basically got the picture finished. Um, you know, it's it's a mixed bag. It's nothing like Chinatown in terms of lasting importance, but it does have its moments, and you can see sort of the bones of what was originally intended. Uh, of course, lovely use of the original poster artwork. Um, you know, it's different, but also, you know, it has touches to the Chinatown artwork. Of course, you have the Paramount letterbox cover. Has the original uh, Dolby Stereo track as PCM on the digital tracks, which sounds wonderful. This is a very nice transfer. Um, this film has not come to Blu-ray yet. Here's the gatefold done to match Chinatown's gatefold. It's actually kind of nice. This larger panel's on the right, whereas the Chinatown one was on the left, so you could technically open them and put them side to side. Here's the rear. This cover's in much better shape, and like Chinatown, it has a nice gloss on it. Uh, otherwise, no special features or anything. Uh, the DVD Special Collector's Edition has some uh, interviews with Nicholson and a bit about the film, so there are some extras on that. But that film hasn't come. This film hasn't come to Blu-ray yet. Which would make a pretty nice Blu-ray. The photography is very good. Next, we move on to essential Laserdisc ownership titles. This is Die Hard, the THX uh, letterboxed release with 5.1 EC3. Of course, beautifully using uh, a section of the original poster artwork. I, I mean, these you deserve to have. The, you need to have these simply for the covers alone. They're beautiful. Um, what's interesting about this? This came out in 1995, along with the reissue of two, and then the debut of three. It was also available in a DTS pressing, but those are very rare and hard to find and expensive. Um, but this essentially, uh, it seems to be the first release that used the uh, 70 millimeter audio track as the source for its audio mix. Uh, originally, this film came out in 35 millimeter Dolby stereo and uh, was so successful that Fox apparently decided to do a 70 millimeter blow up. And when they made the 70 millimeter mix, uh, they apparently beefed it up a bit. Um, so if you compare this to the older disc, which we'll get to in a second, uh, you will notice maybe a few slight differences in EQ levels, a couple different effects here and there. So, you know, it's a different flavor, but this is much bolder, and this same audio track has been reused on each successive edition. So if you get the current Blu-ray, it has a lossless rendering, which for all three of the first three Die Hard films, they sound so far best on Blu-ray. Um, of course, outside of the DTS laser discs, which I don't have because they're very expensive. But these are beautiful, and they certainly have the best covers of any release. And you get a wonderful gatefold with nicely printed liner notes that you can actually read without squinting your eyes, which is always a plus. And the white goes very well on the black, so it's very nice to the eyes, and you get wonderful stills from the film. And of course, Nakatomi Plaza on fire is always nice. <laughs> Uh, chapter stops, and you do get the uh, trailers for Die Hard 1 and 2. Um, otherwise, all the special features are on the later DVDs, and those were reported to the Blu-rays. Um, it is a very good picture transfer for a Laserdisc. Uh, you know, it's it's a great disc all around. It has a 2.0 rendering of that 70 millimeter mix as a matrix surround on the uh, digital tracks, so you, you don't have AC3 capability. You can still have the superior sound. Uh, compared to the older release. But it's very nice to have and definitely the best packaging Die Hard's ever gotten on disc. Um, so it's it's nice to have and this is one of those titles that you just, it's great to have on Laserdisc. Next of course we have Die Hard 2. Same thing all around. Uh, beautiful use of the original artwork on a Laserdisc jacket. You get the uh, THX badge on top with the widescreen banner. Um, so it's uniform of one and three. Um, came out the same time. So I'm surprised they never offered these in like a box set when they came out, but oh well, at least these are perfectly produced and they're very common and very cheap. Same thing here. Nice liner notes. And all these covers are glossy, which is very nice. And at the end you get the uh, trailers for Die Hard 2 and 3. Here's the rear cover. Now, the sound is better than the uh, original issue, so I think it may be, again, 
uh, seeing as there's a little bit of differences here and there with the older pressing and this pressing. Uh, this may have been mastered from a 70 millimeter source and the older source may have come from a 35 millimeter source. So um, that's another reason why I'm gonna show you the older pressing in a second. So there's that one. And of course, Die Hard 3. Similar package design using the original art. I love the way they were able to take a section of the original posters and use them beautifully on the 12-inch uh, LaserDisc jacket. And you get three nice renderings of McLean that kind of go well side by side. Uh, same jacket design, so they're uniform in that way. I've got an insert in here, of course. Catch the latest in laser news. Always love keeping these things in here. It's very rare that you find any laser inserts anymore. So, same thing here. You get a nice rendering of, a, of the opening explosion in New York City on the back behind the liner notes. Get your chapters. This one has the trailers for one, two, and three. Uh, it's a pretty good transfer for LaserDisc, but you can tell uh, this one has been a bit overprocessed. The DVD um, special edition, and I think the first one used the same master, but especially the special edition DVD is pretty notorious for being terrible. It's probably the worst example of edge enhancement I've ever seen. It's just a horrible mess, and it hurts your eyes to watch it. Uh, the Blu-ray finally fixes all this. It's a new HD transfer, and it looks great. Um, you know, it's probably not as good as a 4K version, or if you get the chance to see a 35 millimeter print of this, which it's pretty rare to see Die Hard on film, uh, especially in 2018. Uh, but the master looks much better on LaserDisc. I don't think they did as much post-processing, but you can tell it's not quite as good as uh, 2 and 3 or other 1995 films on LaserDisc. But the sound is great. You get it in both uh, AC3 5.1 and a 2.0 matrixed version. Um, so it's very nice to have to complete having all three on LaserDisc. And of course the cover is great. So as usual, LaserDisc packaging wins out. Let's put this back in here. Next we have the original Fox letterbox release of Die Hard. Um, this is actually a later pressing. You can tell by having the Fox video logo. Usually if you get a slightly later pressing, they're less prone to noise and such. But anyway, um, I do believe the uh, original CBS logo Fox uh, pressing of Die Hard was one of, if not their first letterboxed release. I think it's something on the LDDB says list, something like that. Um, of course, the transfer is not as clean. It has slightly different color. It has a little bit of damage compared to the 1995 repressing. Um, but this does have the different 2.0 matrix soundtrack as a PCM on the digital tracks. And it does sound a bit different and it is mixed differently. So that leads me to presume this is the um, original 1988 Dolby Stereo mix that you would have heard on the 35 millimeter release. Still, this is a very nice release to have, especially getting in in good shape. You get the original poster artwork on the regular Fox sleeve. You get a very standard style um, Fox letterbox gatefold. They usually have these same blocks somewhere with a uh, gatefold image. And here you have a wonderful rendering, although it looks a bit faded, of the uh, explosion on the roof. You get some liner notes cast list and here's the rear cover standard fox style but it looks very nice and of course this being a uh, later one probably from like the early 90s or so um, it's pressed a bit better and the cover is actually glossy so that's important to have for the audio mix and if you'd like to see what older transfers look like there we have the same for Die Hard 2 uh, sorry this jack has a little bit of water damage but I got it for practically nothing and I want to just check it out for comparison sakes. And like Die Hard 1, you know, it had slightly different color. Die Hard 2 really fluctuates in color across different formats and transfers. If you put them all side by side, you'll notice each one looks different. Some are brownish, some are grayish. You know, the color timings across the board. Uh, this has a 2.0 matrix surround mix on the digital tracks, which does sound different to the reissue and the later versions. So again, it may be that this is the 35 millimeter Dolby Stereo mix as opposed to 70 millimeter source mix. Uh, very much the same as the first film. Fortunately, this always wants to 
yeah, I can't really pull it apart because it's kind of stuck together. Hopefully I'm going to replace this with a better copy, but the discs are fine. Um, you know, not as good as the later disc, but you know, it's nice to have for the different transfer and sound mix. So, and it's very, very cheap. These are usually cheaper than the THX disc. Next we have another very important laser disc title. This is the 91 Raiders of the Lost Ark letterbox release from Paramount. Uh, this is the first major letterbox release of the film. Another one where the pan and scan is a crime. Um, beautiful, beautiful use of the Richard Amsel 1980, uh, I believe 81 or 82 reissue artwork, which is one of my favorite posters of all time. And they kind of printed it on this sort of uh, parchment looking background, I guess, to give it that sort of aged look and it matches the designs for two and three. Um, same thing as Paramount usually does, but this time they kind of gave it a little bit different look. So you can tell this is slightly special being an indie film. Uh, no special features or anything to speak of. Here's the rear cover. It's a nice pressing, covers glossy. And again, you know, they kind of treated it differently. So all three indie films look somewhat similar on the shelf and go together. Interestingly enough about this, it has a great transfer, um, which is different than the one on the DVD. And of course the Blu-ray abomination where they uh, mess with the color and contrast and sound. Uh, but interesting about this disc is the soundtrack is a uh, 2.0 matrix uh, Dolby surround track as PCM on the digital tracks. And the mix is very, very, um, I guess the best term would be gutsy. Uh, it has very good use of the single channel surround. It sounds wonderful. Um, it sounds different to the older releases, which uh, had the Dolby stereo from 1981, presumably, which is much more limited. So that's uh, led me and some others to believe that perhaps this was either a custom home video remix that they didn't talk about, or it was, um, it's probably not derived from the 70 millimeter mix because the DVD 5.1 track was supposed to be from the 70 millimeter mix. And that one sounds different to this one as well. Um, so this might be either a home video track they did or uh, Raiders was originally mixed for the Vista Sonic system, which was a uh, system Paramount backed. It had a uh, different methodology of putting uh, separate optical tracks on a print instead of using a matrixing system. So you'd have four optical tracks on a 35 millimeter print. They were really small though. So you, instead of having to use a uh, matrixing process, you had the tracks separate. But it was very much prone to failure and uh, notoriously failed at the premiere of Popeye and there was no fallback system. So it kind of went by the wayside and only was used three or four times. So Raiders was hastily uh, put through Dolby and uh, so that, I don't know if this comes from that. There's apparently a whole history of different Raiders mixes. There's even a uh, mono mix of Raiders with some different lines and such that was used for uh, 16 millimeter prints and various TV airings. So uh, that's why this disc is important. And this is actually my favorite audio mix of Raiders. This is my favorite way to watch it. And I refuse to watch the Blu-ray, which is horrendous. So this is a very important laser disc to have. So we have another important release. This is the letterbox release of Temple of Doom. Uh, very much the same as the Raiders jacket. I think they came out at about the same time. Again, beautiful use of the one sheet. And I always think it's nice how they extend the title off. And you can clearly tell this has been sized down for uh, VHS printing. Um, but very much the same glossy jacket. And you get a similarly designed gatefold. Except this one goes with black on the rear to go with the original teaser poster. And whereas this just looks wonderful. And here's the rear. Astoundingly good transfer on this. Um, it's even better than the Raiders one because Temple is full of various reds and darkness shot, shots of darkness in the caves and the temple itself and beautiful landscape shots. Um, this, this is pretty much near reference grade for Laserdisc. This is one of my favorite transfers. And the audio mix is unbelievable. It's another uh, 2.0 matrix Dolby surround track is PCM digital. Um, but this thing is so aggressively mixed that, I mean, you'd swear it was 5.1 half the time. Um, 
you know, you can put it side by side with 5.1 on the DVD and the Blu-ray, and you know, they all pretty much sound alike, but this one just has something to it, and it, it quickly became my favorite way to watch Temple along with Raiders. Um, because the transfer is wonderful. I mean, half the time you'd swear it's a DVD. And uh, of course the DVD was good and the Blu-ray is good. Um, but the audio mix is wonderful. I don't know the source lineage of it, but it's just incredible. So if you need a great disc to uh, test both your picture quality and your audio quality, this is a great choice. And again, it's essential for that really aggressive uh, 2.0 surround track and having a fantastic transfer. Now, unfortunately, I wish I could say the third film was as good in picture and sound as the first two, but here's the Last Crusade release. Of course, same design. This disc, unfortunately, came out earlier, um, I believe in 1990, so the picture quality is not as good. Um, you'll definitely know it's an older disc if you watch uh, the trilogy in a row. Um, but you know, it's a nice scope transfer. It, it does look a little contrasting, a little washed out in comparison to the other two, of course, but it's not a bad laser disc. Of course, you can tell the old extended play logo on here means this is an older disc. I do like how they put the Lucasfilm logo on the front where they usually put like a studio logo, like a Fox badge or something. So, um, but of course it kind of looks odd because it's the only one I know of that does that. Here's the jacket. Of course, it's the older style Paramount, uh, you know, screen captures only, oh, image only um, gatefold, but they're beautifully printed and looks great. So it kind of goes with the other two, but I wish it was uniform. Um, the rear is a black cover, which is unusual for Paramount discs. I think some people have found versions with a white rear. And of course there's a pan and scan version that came out the same time, but again, you know, pan and scan sucks. Um, this does have a uh, 2.0 Dolby surround track which is presumably the same as the 35 millimeter release. Uh, it sounds great, it's exceptionally well mixed, and it's technologically more advanced than the first two, but in terms of the audio experience, I much prefer the first two. They're much raw, they're much more in your face, whereas this one has sort of a feeling of being you know, cleaner. This was you know, specifically credited as being mixed in a THX facility, whereas the other two didn't have all of those certifications. But of course, it sounds great, and it sounds pretty much identical to the uh, 5.1 on the DVD and the Blu-ray, so. But it's nice to have all three. Unfortunately, though, Last Crusade is a little bit prone to rot on some copies. You have to watch out for that. Moving on to the Jack Ryan films. Here we have one of my favorite laser discs. This is the 91 letterbox release of Hunt for Rod October. Uh, scope transfer, which is excellent for the time, um, and has a Dolby surround track as a 2.0 PCM. And it sounds quite excellent. Um, actually, just as good as the 5.1 on the uh, remastered release and the uh, DVDs and the uh, Blu-ray, and for some reason, this is my favorite version. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I've, I've watched this one more than the others, but I just really like something about it, and when I choose to watch this film, I'm usually going to pull out this one, even though it's an older transfer. Typical Paramount jacket, but lovely use of, the, of a shot from the conclusion there. And of course, it should just say, these don't react well to bullets. Typical Paramount rear. This one's black like Last Crusade, so maybe they did do that for a while. But, you know, it's very nicely put together and everything. And this is a very common title, and I recommend pick it up. You'll love it. Um, if you've seen the film, or if you haven't in a while, or you've never seen it, um, I think this is a classic. Very underrated, and, you know, I, I like a lot of John McTiernan's work, and I'll go ahead and say it, I do prefer this to Die Hard. You know, it's much more... Um, intellectual, so maybe that appeals to me, or it really appeals to me that Connery's supposed to be a Soviet submarine captain. Um, that really appeals to my sense of humor, I guess. But the film is absolutely beautifully put together. Next we, of course, have the AC3 5.1 remastered reissue with the uh, THX stamp. Um, of course, these came out in the late 90s and were essentially ported for the first DVDs, so they're much rarer and hard to come by. 
was lucky enough to pick up this copy sealed. I need to spin it up and uh, give it a good go around and really do a uh, direct comparison to the 91 release. But of course, it's got much more information and such. And um, But again, it's pretty much the same as the first DVD, which was non-anamorphic and had 5.1. So it was pretty much a port of this. Um, so one day I'm going to do a direct comparison of every version of these. Now we have the standard letterbox release of Patriot Games, the second film in the Jack Ryan series. It has a Dolby Surround 2.0 Matrix track, which sounds wonderful. Uh, very good picture transfer for a disc of the time. Standard Paramount jacket with the original artwork, which looks wonderful on the Laserdisc format. Here's the rear cover. Pretty standard, no special features, but all in all, it's a nice disc for you know a film of this vintage. Paramount was pretty good at making solid discs. And then we have the, again, rarer and rather hard to find AC3 reissue, which uses the whole jacket and just gives you the remastered digital sound banner. Uh, again, the original artwork looks great on the Laserdisc jacket. Here's the rear. You can tell this is a much later 90s pressing. Uh, the uh, Dolby AC3 5.1 sounds, you know, a bit better than the uh, 2.0 Matrix track which uh, is pretty much the same as the older disc. Um, this film, of course, did get a 70 millimeter blow up. I don't know if that if the 5.1 derives from that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did because it does sound a little bit more expansive, a um, little bit more powerful. And of course, this was recycled for the first DVD, and then they made a special edition with bonus features. Uh, the Blu-ray of Patriot Games, though, is pretty crummy. It's loaded with uh, DNR, digital noise reduction, and uh, the laser discs are great, the DVDs are great, and the Blu-ray is pretty crap. So hopefully it gets a reissue since Paramount seems to be doing reissues now. Now we have a very rather important title. This is the third Jack Ryan film, Clear and Present Danger. Letterbox release from the mid-90s, THX uh, mastering stamp. Uh, what's important about this, this is one of the first uh, discs to have 5.1 Dolby AC3. Uh, it was used in a lot of uh, demo shops. People used it to demo their home theaters, particularly the uh, scene where the convoy is ambushed in an alleyway. You get some beautiful uh, directional panning of some uh, rocket-propelled grenades and explosions. So. Um, Otherwise, it's very standard, it's very common, but it's interesting to have, you know, one of the first AC3 releases. Uh, it does have a 2.0 Matrix track uh, on the uh, digital tracks, which also sounds excellent. Of course, not as uh, not as good as the 5.1 because it lacks the uh, discrete channels. Uh, this mix is also pretty hot and in your face because being an untouched uh, 1990s theatrical audio mix, pretty much. Uh, this was recycled for the first DVD, which um, was then uh, made into a special edition with a remix soundtrack and extra features. And then the Blu-ray, like Patriot Games, is loaded with noise reduction, is an old master, and is pretty crummy. So uh, the Laserdisc is important to have. If you want the extras, you can grab that second DVD or the Blu-ray if you really want it, or you get the Jack Ryan box set. Um, but still, this is nice to have. Well, you know, I think this and True Lies were the first two titles to have AC3. So um, you would have seen this in every demo store set up in America for about a year or two at least. So 